from some really terrible, which started from some really terrible poetry I wrote in college. And I needed a place to access, I needed a place to archive these poems. So my cousin offered to build a blog for me and that was in 2002. Um, the blog continued to, 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 I guess, build steam and, you know, I got a bit of an audience and then I connected with, uh, with a person I met through blogging who goes by Panama Jackson. And we met in 2004 and we created Very Smart Brothers in 2008. Now at the time um, uh, we created BSB, he was working on Capitol Hill and I had a job. I was a high school English teacher and then I worked at Duquesne University in Pittsburgh in a school business there. In 2009, I got laid off, in fact, the entire program shut down and I made the choice to, to write full time from then. And now when I say I made the choice, you know, I, I need to qualify it because it's like, I don't know, I want to learn how to swim. Okay, well, here you are in 20 feet of water. So swim. <laughs> swim. <laughs> and also I live in Pittsburgh. I live in Pittsburgh. Um, and Pittsburgh, compared to other mid-Atlantic cities, doesn't really, you know, of all the bad things you could say about Pittsburgh, and I will say some, if you give me a chance to, one good thing is that the cost of living here isn't as steep as it is in like Philly, DC, New York City. So you could create a career and have a life as a freelance artist, freelance writer in a way that, you know, like if I lived in DC, I would have needed to have roommates, <laughs> you know, to live the life that I lived for about three or four years. And then, you know, I was fortunate enough that uh, the blog continued to blow up and then other opportunities came book deal came and then the blog got acquired um, by Univision. But, um, but again, the, the freelance path was the only path available for me. Um, but I wouldn't recommend it to people because I don't know it. I, I wouldn't recommend someone following or trying to attempt, attempting to replicate what I did because I'm not sure if those same sort of opportunities are available today um, as they were 12 or 13 years ago. Um, or even 10 years ago. Um, but, but again, but there are other paths, but yeah. I appreciate the honesty. How about you, Janelle? Uh, I got started and first of all, hi everybody. I got started in freelance, um, kind of like Damon out of necessity. I was in school. I kind of knew, um, I went to Lincoln University, LU. And, <laughs> and um, I knew that I wanted to be a writer probably like my sophomore year. But then unfortunately, well, not unfortunately, uh, plot twist, I got pregnant. And so then all of like the cool internships like I planned to do, um, and then I had talked to my professors about, couldn't do those anymore, couldn't go to New York City and you know work at, at the time I wanted to work for Vibe so bad. And so, I uh, couldn't do that anymore. So I had to hustle and I had to learn how to pitch and I had to like, I still could do it, but I just wasn't gonna be able to do it the way that I thought I was gonna do it. And so I taught myself how to pitch. I taught myself how to, cause Lincoln didn't have a journalism program. So I had to teach myself how to write articles, not just essays and, and my thoughts, but like actually structure a reported story. And so then I started pitching and uh, took an editing test for a magazine and the editor was like, you totally make this article sound like you. <laughs> you failed the editing test, but she liked my writing style. So she gave me my first writing gig. And then from there, I just built and built and built. And then uh, <laughs> I had full-time jobs. In 2012, I got laid off from my full-time job. And the lady, they brought in some like HR lady. And I guess she was supposed to like console me from losing my job. And I was like, <laughs> Girl, wow, like I was so excited to get out of there. Like, <laughs> she was so, she was caught off guard by my enthusiasm because I had already, like, I had tried freelancing full time once before, didn't work out because I was very poor. I was poor. So I had to go back into the working world again. And then, but then by, it was like maybe three years later, I had picked up a lot more publications and clients. And this time I can make it stick. So I've been freelancing full time ever since. It'll be 10 years next year. All right. 
I like the way you all, I have all like shown, like just, it just takes the courage to just go for it. Like eventually you just have to just try it, whether you do a little bit or you go, go in full, full feet, speed ahead, you just got to try. Um, so let's talk about discernment and how you decide, like, this is one of the two questions I get a lot is how do you decide like what projects or articles you're going to pitch and who you're going to pitch it to? How do you make that decision because it, it is a critical decision when you get a the story idea in, in your head you think it is a good idea how do you go about that so you might want to jump in and volunteer I'll, I'll jump in um i don't know about everybody else i have you know about four or five places that i write for regularly and i've gotten to know the editors and when I first started writing for them, one of the first conversations that we had was when they like to be pitched, um, whether they like long form stories that will take you, you know, some weeks to do, or whether they want it like, you know, tomorrow, um, you, you have that discussion early. And so I, I approach it just like approaching a beat. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, if you have certain interests, you're reading everything, watching everything, you're getting pitches, um, you're paying attention to what's going on in social media. So the way you would, when you have a regular beat, um, you're coming up with story ideas. That's what happens with me. And when I get an idea, I think of, okay, who would, who would run this? And um, I kind of, uh, I may have like three places in mind and I'll first go to the place where I think the story would work the best. And then um, if they say no, we'll pass, and I go, you know, to the next one. I don't like to pitch um, several people at the same time because I'm always panicked about what if like two people say yes, you know, <laughs> then when, then how am I going to explain that? But um, that's kind of how I go about it. You know, they they all have different personalities, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's kind of how you figure out what would be the best fit. Can I can I piggyback off of that because that 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 stress is real. Like if you get a, you don't want to send so many stories to some. Well, you don't want to send one really good story to multiple publications at the same time because there there has been one time where more than one person said yes, and luckily another person declined and gave me another story. But I was nervous at one point because I'm like, oh, holy crap. I mean, this is good because I'm pitching, you know, better, but it's kind of confusing to have like two publications and then you kind of have to break it to them if, you know, something doesn't give. But um, to follow up with that, that is a very good way um, of looking for different story ideas. And to follow up with that, I would say like I do cover more of my stories like my entire profile is a beat because I do have a specific style in a specific kind of topic that I cover. And I feel like each story that I write is a part of me. So usually I just go through life and kind of stumble upon something and continue to do research on that one thing. Uh, case in point, um, I stumbled across this really dope album called Sonic Wave for Bandcamp. And that was like one of like my proving ground kind of stories for the publication. But I randomly found like a commercial of like Sonic the Hedgehog just going, you know, going through this first level and it's a whole album, like a whole thing following that. So I'm like, oh, this is, this is dope. And then I go to the actual album, it's on Bandcamp. So now I got a story and now I'm pitching that story. And after that, I try to follow up. I try to share things on my Instagram, kind of, you know, letting these artists know and letting people know about these artists, but specifically letting artists know that like, Hey, I might not always text you, but I still have you on my mind. I'm still promoting your stuff. Whenever you have anything new coming out, like this gives me more ideas to pitch on you. That way I'm following up with more story ideas instead of just being like, okay, this is a one-off, you know, because sooner or later, you're probably going to have to circle back to that artist, especially if they're doing something that is monumental and trending on a national basis. So just being able to not only stay up to date with social media, making sure you read things as a, as a music journalist, making sure you listen to a, a ton of stuff. And then not only just music, but also like music history podcasts. That way you can stay up to date with anniversaries or finding things that are obscure and outside of the trending space, 
but might be trending in the future or might be big in the future. Just being able to have an open mind to many of these topics and staying consistent, you know, whether it's on the internet or, you know, through a book or magazine, that's very important when it comes to pitching these stories. And then when you, when you actually pitch those ideas, you know, make sure that you're, you have numbers, make sure you have specific details. Um, one, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Marlon, Marlon Walker, he told me that you need to make sure that you send pitches where the editor doesn't really have to answer a question. Like you make sure you send all of all of the specific details to make that editor say, okay, I don't really have to answer a question. I just mainly need to see if this works for the site or not. And if you did your correct research, it should work for the site. But that's just the whole breakdown. <laughs> I hear you there. How about you, Linda? <clears throat> Um, I want to pick up on something you said, Vance, which is talking about numbers and like having your pitch be kind of solid. And because I my main um, gig is the New York Times magazine, often I'm pitching black stories to white editors. And so you have to have all the details be solid. Less now because of Nicole and the 1619 thing, but um, because now they're like, oh my God, this really works. But before it was like, if I'm, if I'm pitching about black, gay, and bisexual men in the South having HIV, then it's like, I had so many numbers in that first, that was my first pitch for the magazine. I met my editor at a party and she said, didn't you used to work at the Times newspaper in Essence? I said, yeah, I did. Um, if you ever want to pitch. So I was terrified, but I pitched this story because I knew it was good. Um, and there were numbers that were surprising. So, cause I'm in the science medical you know, arena, um, I'm like, okay, what is the number that is compelling? What is the trend that is compelling? What has changed that it, that I can say and build on that trend, that number, the statistic, the study. And so, um, and then I try to now go as big as I can. So the, I just did a pitch on trauma today. It was really bad. I went too big, but I'm like, okay, here's the number. Everybody feels traumatized. What is the, what are the research in this? And, you know, I think it will come to your later question about how much pre-reporting you do on a pitch, but I, that's how I start. I start with something that surprises me or, and, but then I build on it to make sure it's solid because of dealing with white editors. Indeed. Damon, what were you going to say? Yeah. I'll, um, I'll add to that you know, uh, one way, I guess, to to go at the, the pitch is to reverse engineer in a way where you um, you have a relationship with an editor or with a publication. And so instead of you picking up an idea and then going out like, hey, do you want this or are you interested in this? You have a conversation with the editor, you know the publication and you look at what's on that publication and you decide, okay, well, what works for them? So you tailor it specifically for a particular publication and you think of an idea that is, that is, that is unique that's particularly for that publication instead of thinking of a pitch that could go you know, to five or six other places. Now, that pitch maybe you think of for that publication, if they pass on it, then maybe you could take it out somewhere else. But, um, but yeah, when I pitch now, it's usually me just okay you haven't I haven't seen a, a column about this thing I haven't seen uh deconstruction of this thing on this particular publication so I'm going to do that um and it's it's one of those things too where I and and, and maybe we'll get into more of this as the night goes on but I um sometimes I repeat myself where I'll I'll think of a topic or I'll think of an angle and then like 15 minutes into the thought, I realize I've written about it already. And so tailoring, doing the reverse engineer tailoring um, is a way of preventing that from happening um, because that happens a lot. And I don't know if that's just, I don't know, me having kids now and I, I have like the young kid brain fog because I have a five-year-old, two-year-old or, or something, but it's just happening more and more and more. So, so yeah. You look up the topic and find that, oh, I've written up this book already. <laughs> yeah, that, I mean, I, it, that happens. And, and the thing is, I'm not as prolific as I used to be. 
like back in like 2017, 2018. But during that time, that was happening at least once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, at least once a week, yeah. Janelle, what about you? How do you decide what you're going to pitch? Um, so it's kind of twofold. I'll take, if I have an idea, um, I take it and pick it apart and try to figure out, does it have a, a health component? Can I pitch it to a health publication? Does it have um, a social justice component that I can, does it have like something really zen and calming that I can pitch to, oh, does it have like, so I'll, I'll find a way to kind of dissect it and see what fits in each publication. That way I make more money off of one idea for one. And for two, <laughs> I can get, I can meet more, uh, make more editors happy, build more relationships all off of one idea. And then um, I have a dream list of publications. Like I still wanna write for that. I haven't written for the New York Times yet. Don't wanna write for the Times. Um, and I think that's the only one major publication that I haven't written for yet. But I have a, usually have like a dream list, my hit list. And then I have other publications that if my hit list rejects me, then I'll bump down. I think somebody else said that too. And I'll bump down to the next publication. But then I also have publications that don't pay a lot, but the editors are really cool to work with, or they're really eager for content and they let me write about whatever I want to write about. So I might make less money on, on the outset, but sometimes an editor just needs the confidence to see that another editor has allowed you to write about this thing. And then that will build their confidence so that you can show them like, you, like my editor, the Smithsonian is so dope. I love working with her and she will let me write about the randomest stuff. I'm like, I found this picture and I want, it's a women in the Black Panther party. And she was like, go for it. And they only pay $300. I think I got paid more for that story actually, because it was a lot of reporting. So I might've got to pay, pay like $750, $750, something like that. But um, it did really well. It was part of my portfolio that I could say, you know, I, I kind of excel in, in writing these kind of random stories and doing all the historical digging and stuff, which I really enjoyed. And then um, it gave me a jumping off point to do other stories like that. So now when I come up against um, other random stuff and I have something to shop myself around with. I hear you there about wanting to write for the New York Times and the New York and the Washington Post because that's my hometown paper, of course. Um, <laughs> so, hey, audience, don't let me be the only one asking all the questions here. If you got something you want to ask any of the panelists, feel free to drop it right in the chat and we'll make sure they get to it. OK, and the next question goes right into being black and freelance. This is something that I didn't think about until about maybe five years ago. I'm like, you know, why am I always the only black person that shows up to these little freelance events with other organizations, I, I, you know, and I'm sitting here looking around like, are there other Black freelancers? It took me a minute to find like who um, is also Black and freelance. And then I wonder like, do they struggle with some of the same things that I struggle with sometimes? So I'll let you do that talking on that. Janelle, you want to start since you're right there? <laughs> sure. sure. Um, so I think um, like Linda said, I had initially before Black was in vogue, uh, we had a, I had a hard time making a case for the stories that I wanted to write. Like editors would be like, oh, not really. This is not really. No, no, this is a thing. Black people know it's a thing. So like, but having, you know, have to really have my numbers and my information and my facts and my pre-reporting down so that I could really make a case for it. Um, but that being said, I think I started off writing for all black publications. So, and that's all I ever wanted to write about. My mom was like, you're limiting yourself. And I'm like, I'm really not, mom, calm down. So <laughs> I never saw it as limiting myself because there's so much to write about in, in blackness. And I wrote about, I started off writing about hip hop and entertainment and then going off free shows and albums and concerts and like loving that part and then getting kind of bored with that and then doing health reporting. And so it, it just, it grows and it's it you never run out of things to write about so um I don't feel like I was the only thing about being black was that it was feeling like I had to prove myself but that's just being black just in general unfortunately so I, I just felt like y'all gonna take these stories like whether I have to keep popping up which I do I pops up 
all the time. So if it is a repeat story idea, you'll hear it again next year because, you know, mm -hmm. it still has validity. It's still is something I might need to work on my presentation and I might need to work on my pre-reporting. But I think that um, that's been my, my greatest big challenge is, is proving my story, the worthiness of my story ideas and the worthiness of my content. Vance, you look like you wholeheartedly agree with what you said. Yes, 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 I definitely do. I would probably say um, I didn't really have those problems because I too started originally either working with um, people that were open to Black stories or like Black publications in general. But I think when I started uh, working for some publications that I continue to work with today, um, I think after one editor left and I had to work with another, um, who was a little bit more high ranking, I had to build that confidence from that editor. So he slowly kind of rejected a lot of really good stories that I had, because I had I had a ton of them where I was just like, yo, this is good, this is good, this person got traction. And they were continuously be rejected, but it's, it wasn't like they were bad stories, they just didn't necessarily, it was certain, uh, how should I say, it was certain copyright issues behind it. So I, I, I could understand that, but I had to con consistently kind of prove why this story should matter um, and also kind of prove why I'm a good writer to write features as well um, for this new editor. And now we're at a point where, we're, you know, we have a good relationship and, you know, I can easily write some and I get, you know, certain things that I, I get a little bit more freedom to do. But I think specifically the thing with me when it comes to freelancing was the idea of me being a hip hop writer. Because I started out originally writing for so many like, like hip hop journalist publications, I was beginning to get pigeonholed into that, that, that role. And I didn't like that because that wasn't the only thing that I've covered. Even in you know my college days when I was covering like just artists in like the mixtape era, I always went like the alternative route. I went the rock route. I, cover weird and obscure things so when I was working at all hip-hop at one point I was being pigeonholed into just being that and I think that was the thing that I was dealing with the issues that I was dealing with at that time um and that kind of pushed me to diversify my portfolio more in order for people to just look at my stuff and be like I don't even know what he's look listen I <laughs> like you look at so many stories and it's like oh this most of this stuff is good but it's not specifically one thing. I could literally write about anything as long as I have that curiosity for it. And at one point I was pigeonholed to that. And I think moving forward, I might have that with newer publications, but at the same time, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna make you understand that I'm a great writer and that I can write time-worthy stuff that might even explode in the future, so. Have, you got to prove a point as a freelance. If, if you can't do it through those pitches or if they don't believe you through those pitches, then you got to make them believe through the writing. Ooh. Damon, how about you? As the one of the co-creators of the blackest thing on the internet, what's it like being black? In <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. to keep it a buck, I mean, I, I haven't really had much friction in terms of... Uh, having editors uh, reject my voice, reject my pitches, reject, you know, my, my blackness or, or any topics that, that, that I want to write on. And, you know, a, a much of that is due to, I guess, a certain privilege where they saw that I had B BSB and they saw that, okay, I'm capable of this. And so I had that. So I wasn't necessarily cold pitching um, anybody. But one thing, one obstacle um, that I think is very specific to Black writers, but at least in my experience, is, is has to do with audience. Um, and what I mean is that uh, I could write an article for The Root or for Ebony or whatever, and I could write, or I could write the exact same thing for GQ, for Esquire, for New York Times, and the piece that is on the mainstream publication is going to get more traction on social media. And, 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 and I'm not just talking about from white people, but from us too. Um, and that's, and again, that's something that we talk about privately. And that's something I've noticed um, throughout my career um, where 
and again, I'm. This is a very like messy and nebulous thing to bring up because this isn't always the case, um, and it's not always true, and it, and it definitely depends on the circumstance, it depends on the writer, but. Yeah, I, I would say that. And I wouldn't necessarily even call it an obstacle. I'm gonna walk that back, but it is something that is just peculiar that I've noticed, you know, over I guess almost what 15 years of of freelancing and blogging and writing publicly is um, it's almost as if uh, the pieces from black writers that are on mainstream publications get seen as I don't know more rigorous or more tactile, more quality, um, as as opposed to the ones that me might be on Essence or might be on the Root, might be on the Grio. Mm. Um, and and again, I don't know if anyone else on this call has experienced that or has seen that, but that's definitely something that again that I've seen, I've witnessed happening to other people, and I've seen happen to some of my work sometimes too, where again the pieces that are in the times, and and again. Even as I say that, the Times has a much larger reader base, it has a much larger subscription base than, let's say, the Root does. So, of course, you're going to get more readers and you're going to get more retweets or more shares or whatever. But, um, yeah, I feel like I'm talking too much. So no, talking. I definitely hear you on that point. And I have noticed that and have never voiced it to anybody because I thought it was just me. Melanie, did you think it was just you, too? <laughs> No, definitely not. Um, actually, uh, what Damon was just saying reminded me of, um, well, in the year leading up to the last White House election, I was a freelancer for Fortune covering politics. And um, I made sure I had this weird kind of formula. It was like, okay, three, I'll do three mainstream stories and then I'll do a black story because I, I didn't want to get, you know, pigeonholed. And I wanted to show, you know, I've covered Washington and I can write all the stories. Um, but I was just gonna bring up a couple of other points about bring, bl being black and freelancing. Um, everybody has kind of alluded to this, is that, um, I mean, obviously you have to know what you're doing, work hard, um, know your beat, but a lot of it is about relationships. You have to have all those things in place, but then you have to make contact with the right editor and you have a better chance of that happening if you're at a party like Linda was or, you know, something like that. So for me, I'm, I'm very active in NABJ. So I meet a lot of black editors, but my exposure to other editors is gonna be less. And so I have to work harder at that. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, and another thing I want to bring up, um, this is something that's happened in all industries. Um, since the death of George Floyd, as we all know, you know, a number of companies have wanted to seem woke you know, whatever. So they've created new positions. Um, I have found that I was approached um, um, by people for um, wonderful opportunities, but I did find out the hard way that I had to be really selective about them because um, in the case of one um, publication, they um, wanted me as a guest editor um, for a special issue um, focused on black artists and artisans. So I brought in just a wonderful team of black writers focused on the arts, um, wonderful team of photographers, people who are you know, well known, et cetera. And as soon as we started um, producing the stories, this one editor just picked everything apart. And um, one by one, I felt responsible because I brought all these folks in. One by one, folks were like, I'm done. I'm taking the kill fee. This is too much, <laughs> you know. Um, one one person um, had written a book about um, the blues, and his story was being picked apart by an editor who knew nothing about the blues. Things like that were happening, you know. So that kind of taught me um, it's not enough to um, just do your research on somebody's background, but even make sure you know people who know that person. Um, and I know. I'd say like three other people who've had similar experiences where they were approached for a wonderful opportunity and then it turned into something really um, difficult. So just be careful of that, you know. Linda, what's your take on it? Oh, uh, 
I actually was going to switch over and um, I'm looking at these questions in the chat. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we can, we I was start like, with that. We can um, start with those. yeah. So I was going to say, uh, Tanya, you were asking about you're starting freelance and you're trying to figure out how you're going to do it. Um, you save money. Um, I got left, lost my job at Essence. It was, you know, we had, there were all these crazy things that happened and I was, I, starting freelance. I had two children who were headed to college. So I had to think a lot about money. And so what I did was uh, carved up in my head, a freelance career that was, um, there's a job I'm going to have that makes money. And for that, I was doing a multicultural marketing thing that never had my name on it. It wasn't, you know, it was just like a big pile of money that would come to me. And it wasn't like the most fun thing. It was kind of super easy. I was sort of working at pub, uh, a magazine for public supermarket, a magazine for Pepsi. It was all these things that are sort of like not my usual thing. Then I was doing stuff that was more in my wheelhouse. So I was writing for The Root. I was writing for um, Essence sometimes, Ebony, the Black Publications, um, and some health stuff for women's magazines that didn't pay great for Slate sometimes, but it kept my brand of being a serious health writer out there. And then I had stuff that I just loved that was about activism or creativity. I wrote a novel that was really bad, but I just did it because I had fun. And But I always kept that eye on that money pocket. So eventually things shifted and I didn't have to focus so much on the marketing thing that I didn't love. And I could focus more on the thing that I was really good at and that I cared about, which is writing about health and medicine with a social justice angle. So I was very intentional about money, so much so that I moved my bank account to the bank down the street. So when I walked by the bank, I thought there's my money. <laughs> if I was on a call where people were acting wow. horrible, then I'd be like, you know what? I, I would take my literal paycheck out and look at it. Say, do not pop off at these people who don't know what they're talking about for your little marketing job. Shut up and just get that paycheck so you can do something different. So um, anyway, you can hear that I'm a little bit money driven, but he, that's how I did no, it. That's good. And that was the question that I had from one of the audience members about the money and finance. So let's jump into it. How do you do this freelance life and still be able to not eat ramen noodles seven days a week? Anybody want to start? I mean, it, it helps to marry rich if you could, if you could do that um, or... <laughs> <laughs> or li live in Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, now, if you can't do either of those things, um, yeah, I mean, I not going to mince words. It's um, it's brutal. It can be brutal, you know. And yes, there is the um, I guess the I guess the benefit of the like the spiritual and like metaphysical boost of of, of working working for yourself and and you know not really having a boss you know and having all this freedom and having this ability to be nimble but the money issue is a real thing and you know i'm i'm fortunate enough now where um i'm not struggling the way that i was uh five or six years ago but um you know it it was a struggle it, it was a definite struggle it was a definite you know spending more time chasing down invoices and, and editors and making sure I get paid on time than actually writing. And that, that's a part of it, right? And I think that anyone who enter, who, who wants to do this needs to know reality too, where that, that itself by itself is a full-time job. Um, like there are people who still owe me money. I feel like Kanye, like there's still people who owe me checks, <laughs> right? From like 2013, right? <laughs> Um, and then you have these like labyrinthic, you know, um, ways of getting paid where you have to fill out this form. And then after you fill out this form, you got to fill out this form and talk to this guy. And it's just, man, just keep your money after that point. And so, so again, that is a definite, definite part of it. And, and I, and I feel like the conversations that we have about writing, um, about working in media, working in, in journalism, working in publishing, um, particularly as you know, black people, um, we need to talk more about money. And, and I, I really appreciate what Linda um, was saying um, just now about just how money dictates decision-making. And 
you know, I, I think that when we say that, there's like this connotation of being just money driven and being a quote unquote sellout and all of that. It's like, no, you have to eat. And if this is what you're doing for a living, then you have to make enough money to live, right? And and again, I don't, I don't begrudge anyone who decides to do this. I mean, unless you go work for Fox or fucking, you know, one of those, you know, Brad Bart or whatever, then yes, I will begrudge the hell out of you. But, you know, if you are just trying to do your thing and you are making decisions based on, okay, well, this person is paying on time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this person is paying me this much money um, and kind of gravitating towards the people who are going to pay you on time. Then again, um, I think that's a smart, smart thing to do. I want to get to some of these, but we cannot shake our heads enough about this money thing. Cause that, I mean, we all struggle with that. And it, oh, okay. That's a whole nother hour. We could talk about money. We dance around it a little too much in my, in my opinion, but I want to jump to some of these questions from the audience here. And one says panel, do you stretch beyond your subject matter expertise? Like whatever, wherever, whatever that is when pitching ideas to editors? Can I get two people to answer that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm finding other things. Listen, if if I can even find relations to the topics I already covered and try to dive into that new topic, you know, maybe I can come up with a new story or come out with a new story. But yes, don't be afraid to, you know, go into a topic that you may feel uncomfortable. I mean, some... Some topics, you know, or some coverage might, you know, actually give you trauma. Like that's, that's a real thing. So make sure, you know, you check on yourself in the process of knowing that, but make sure that you put yourself in, you know, situations where you're covering something that, you know, it might be new to you or something that's a little bit different. Because if you do, then first things first, you're published by another publication, something that might be out of your realm, but still something that somebody outside of your realm can say, oh, wow, that's interesting. Maybe I might want to give them an opportunity to write for this publication. Maybe that could be a new opportunity for you. Um, maybe you want to try writing about going from uh, music to politics, and maybe you try doing that, and maybe that creates other relationships with other publications. Definitely don't be afraid to put yourself in these different situations in order to chase a different story because I think it, it's good to find your pocket but if you stay in that pocket and stay consistent in it that's good but then I think that's when the whole pigeonhole idea comes to uh, parlay and if you're not really pigeonholed into maybe the topic that makes money then you might just be covering stories that might not make you that money you know Try new things. Sometimes it might not always work, but try new things. Maybe it's a fatter paycheck in there. Next question. Does it make sense? This is coming from Kristen, right? Does it make sense to, um, I'm sorry, let me start from the beginning of her question. She says, um, hi, thank you. This question is for anyone. I feel that my writing is much stronger than my pitching. Does it ever make sense to submit a completed piece as opposed to a pitch? My answer to that is no. Anybody else want to elaborate on that? Can I get one volunteer? Uh, depends on the publication and the editor. Like if you have a good relationship with the editor, then maybe you could do that. But um, I would, I would definitely advise against cold pitching, um, doing that. Uh, but but again, if if you have a relationship with an editor like that, then. You could you could do that, but I would probably advise against that in most other cases. Yeah. Also, if it's oh sorry, go Janelle. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Linda. Okay. I was gonna say if it's short, and then you know you didn't put a you know you're really voicey, and then you wrote some really smart shortish essay, and I'm short for you, your time, but also for the editor to get through it. So you want, but it's got to, you know, like I I heard you say, I'm a good writer, not a good pitcher. So that might work, but I wouldn't, you know, invest in that too much too often. Yeah, I think I'm a I'm much better writer than I am a pitcher as well. I'm an improved pitcher, but I'm not a great pitcher. But um, I would say that I totally lost my train of thought. I held on to it. Never mind. 
<laughs> okay, I'll go to another question here. How about from Maria Roberts? She says, hey, thanks to the panel. Question, if you're starting over, is it better to blog or simply write and pitch? That's a tough one. That's I, I was just going to say, do both. I, I have my own site um, that it's still a work in progress, but uh, like the lead story on there is something I spent a year reporting. I'm really proud of it. And um, I found to my surprise that people who I had pitched to, um, without me suggesting it, they had gone back and looked at the site um, just to get a better idea of you know, my skills. So, I mean, if you can do both, I think it's always a, a good thing. Yes, Medium is a great tool to use if you get bored and you just wanna write. Um, I wrote like two stories on it just to, just to try things out, but they, it actually brings readers and there's people that will actually read your stuff, you know, and, 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 and like it. And, you know, the more likes, the more part, more, the better the chances of it being a part of Medium's algorithm, things of that matter. So just like take that time to write for yourself. I wouldn't say stress about writing, you know, on a blog for yourself. I would probably say find, you know, that consistency and be able to manage time in the process. Um, but definitely blogging can help you out when it comes to, you know, showing clips to different editors to kind of prove to them that you're really consistent at this. You really want to do this and you're serious. Um, and then also to the last question, yeah, I'm a horrible, I'm not going to say I, I'm not, I'm not a horrible pitcher. But I'm not the best pitcher either. If you if you have a quote unquote lengthy pitch, I will probably break it down into different sentences just to make it as easy for that editor to read as possible. That way, everything is kind of broken down, but you still have all of the specific details you need to get that story passed. But that was a two. I agree with you because you really have I'm very little time with the editor. They, they have a very short attention span and they don't call it an elevator pitch for nothing. All right. I'm sorry, Janelle, do you want to say something real quick? Uh, yes, I, I remember what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to say, so um, when you write a pitch, you're writing it for a specific publication with that in mind, with that style in mind, with that voice and you're crafting your voice around what that publication, what that editor is going to want for that publication. So if you don't know already that the editor is going to run it, then you're kind of wasting your time because then you have a fully written piece that will need to be tweaked and tweaked and tweaked to fit for another publication. So it becomes a waste of time. I had to learn to look at my time at an hourly rate. And so if I'm spending my time doing edits and nobody is paying me to do these edits, then that's a waste of my time and my money. Mm -hmm. Last two questions, I, and I promise I'm done. I'm can sorry, I just, just add done. a couple of very quick things? Okay. Yeah, uh, just um, as far as the uh, pitching, um, if you've ever worked in a traditional newsroom, I like to think of the pitch as um, what we've called in my newsrooms, the budget line. Every editor would write a bu budget line designed to get the story on the front page. So think about what makes it enticing, make it short, when can you file it? You know, what photos are real? All that stuff that an editor would need to know makes up a good pitch. And then um, the other thing I just want to say about the money, um, sometimes it helps to have like a steady part-time job. So, which is what I'm doing now. I'm helping NABJ create a site and that's, you know, <laughs> steady. So even though I might be fighting with four people about my invoice or whatever, <laughs> I know that there's always income coming in. So, and that leads right that. into this question from mm -hmm. Jamila Bay. She says, "Hi, Jamila. First of all, um, I don't know, I don't know no black Hannah Horvath, whose parents cover written NYC. But isn't it fair to say that except those in the four one two, you have to think about having a straight gig until you get where you want? I know I have a straight gig. It has absolutely nothing to do with media because I have to feed my family. So, what do you think?" I did not. I left without having, uh, I, I knew I didn't want to go into another job. I, had, I was a single mom. I had a daughter and we just made it work. One year I made $7,000 and by the grace of God, the grace, <laughs> we lived. I don't even know how because my rent was $1,000. So the math just don't work out. But 
we ate, <laughs> we survived. At one point I was on food stamps, like full disclosure, like we were poor. But every time I applied for a job, I didn't get it. And so I knew this was what I was supposed to do. It's just a matter of what my, so I had to start being more strategic about my time. Like I said, about the money and looking at my hourly rate and being more strategic about my time and treating my writing more like a business and chasing checks and not letting people go past 30 days. And then I had also had to look at how my income was coming in. Corporate pays almost instantly. When you do corporate writing and do association writing, they pay you a lot faster than that dumb 30 day cycle that um, magazines put you on, some of 60 days. So I had some magazine work coming in, some income coming in like that. I would take editing gigs that had income coming in from that. So I think diversity and diversifying the work that you do is super important if you want it to be your full-time gig. I was going to say, oh, sorry. Um, okay. I ghostwriting is a good, I was a ghostwriter. I realized I'm not the best personality for that. Cause I'd be like, you know, I didn't like to be treated poorly. <laughs> there were other people who could take the, you know, the complaining and the rewriting and editing, but that actually was, you know, often a good gig. You can make 30 to $50,000 if you get with a, on a good book ghostwriting gig. Um, I was writing my own books, but also doing this ghostwriting. I did it when, once while I was pregnant because I was like, I need money for my children. And then later I'm like, I need money for my children to go to college. And I did it again. And that was really a good chunk of change, even though torturous sometimes. I definitely focus on, well, I currently have a full-time job. Um, I definitely focus more on uh, support. Uh, in the medium realm, instead of me trying to cover stories as like a reporter. I know that sounds weird, but uh, specifically where I'm at, I'm quite comfortable while I can also pitch. But before then, I worked at Sirius XM and I wasn't making that much and I was part time with no benefits. So like just being able to balance that with covering stories. Luckily, I was able to like write a lot more and also follow the different trends because they happen to be the same topic even though they were different at the same time but just being able to find that other and it doesn't you don't have to like get part-time or like a full-time job obviously we see that like you if you really put the hustle and the grind into it it's brutal but you can actually make a living off of this but if you feel like you have to have that job or that consistency to pay your bills that is completely understandable do what you can but i would probably say from my experience for like you know, the younger people, the what we consider green, the people that can actually make those risky choices is to definitely try to look for opportunities that can help boost your writing. Um, it doesn't always have to be an opportunity in media. Like I was a substitute teacher at one point and it paid for me to eat, you know, to actually eat. But at the same time, I had the time to write pitches to different magazines. You know, I had other opportunities where I might have some downtime and I might be able to send off emails. And that's that's how I was grinding at one point. I mean, I'm still grinding like that to this day. So like, I would probably say, you don't, if you're going to go full-time with this, like really ball out. But if you feel like you have to have that stability, because I do know that, you know, sometimes those checks come in a lot farther than what you may expect. Um, you know, if you have to get an opportunity, get an opportunity but get an opportunity that can actually help you write. Don't be in a situation like me where I'm literally telling my boss, like, I'm not about to work here in 30 minutes. Like, I'm about to leave so I can go go get this other story. And and they look at you crazy because you're working at JC Penney's, but I'm like, yeah, I'm literally about to do this. And I'm going to come back to work the next day and you're not going to say anything. So, yeah, don't, don't be like Vance in 2016. <laughs> yeah, I think... It, it also, um, it helps to be self-aware. And and, I, and I, I think that, you know, some people maybe do need the, uh, you know, the more solid day job in order to have the mental freedom to be able to write and not, and not, and not be so money focused, so money desperate even. And because, you know, that can, you know, I spoke of it before as like a, as an ambition generator, but that also can make things very muddy and very cloudy um, for you if, if you allow it to. Um, but at the same time, I, I keep coming back to that scene from 
the Dark Knight Rises where Batman is trying to get out of the cave that the, the prison that Bane put him in and he's trying to crawl out and he's not able to crawl out until he tries to do it with no rope. And I'm not calling myself Batman, but I, I know that um, if I had a full-time job while I was pursuing the, uh, while I was starting my blog and doing more freelance stuff and pitching and doing all that stuff, then I wouldn't have put as much effort or, or as much energy into surviving or into making a career that way because it wouldn't have been as survival um, base for me. Um, but again, desperation can be a motor bear and it can also be a distraction mm -hmm. too. So that's, you know, this comes back to my point about being self-aware. And I, I'm just seeing this question from Brandon really quickly about oh, someone question? Like, who hasn't paid him in three months. I think that don't redact the name of the company. I, I feel like if you want to get paid, then you need to say, hey, Slate, New York Mag, Ebony, y'all didn't pay me for three months. Go on Twitter, go on Facebook, go wherever you can mm -hmm. and let people know. And instead of, you know, talking, subtweeting <laughs> or an organization or subtweeting a publication, just put your names out there and say it. Yeah. Um, because if, if the goodness of their heart isn't allowing them to pay, then maybe shame will. I just want to um, add to that, that um, the Authors Guild has a legal team. Um, you can join for, I think it's like $20 a month. And if you have an issue with contracts or being paid or anything like that, they will help back you up. Also Society of Professional Journalists has um, like a legal type team that might help you out and give you at least the answer your questions and help you craft the right kind of, you know, email. <laughs> you know what, take that advice, don't, I, I'm basically just saying burn bridges. Don't don't listen to what I just said. Listen to what Candace and what Melanie said. Do not <laughs> take my <that> advice. <laughs> you got to hold people's feet to the fire. Because like, yeah, like, it's just straight disrespectful. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you got to kick in a couple of doors. Sometimes yeah, you got to I mean, you do. Them. You do, but there are resources available. There are, there are resources available. You don't have to, you know, do some guerrilla shit and just, you know, you know, burn every bridge. You can use you know, there, there are, this is why organizations like this exist, you know, yeah. for people who are having trouble getting money and, and things of that nature. So yeah, don't listen to me. And you can also band together because if a magazine or whatever, some publication isn't paying you, they're probably not paying other people. So I don't, Janelle, were you involved with Heart and Soul? And there was that everybody was mad because we didn't get paid. And so, um, you know, it, but I don't know if anybody, I think I got a little bit of mine, but but we band, everybody was banned together to say, wait, none of us has gotten paid. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna fight this together. And that was really, I'm still friends with some people from that, from when that happened. Yeah, I wasn't on Heart and Soul. Uh, I was friends with Kendra Lee and she was on Heart and Soul. I heard about the whole, I heard about it. But uh, I was an Ebony writer and I saw uh, Brandon say it's Ebony and I'm like, <laughs> I'm, okay. <laughs> it's always Ebony. Always. Hey, yo. Hey, yo. <laughs> I wanted to add one thing that um, I've noticed that there are a lot of fellowships right now. Um, Janelle, I know you had the, you know, you had the Rosalind Carter for writing about mental health. And that was one that's been around a long time, but I'm gonna say there are a ton of new ones, especially if you write about health and medical, but not only that, if you write about social justice and it's not just the giant things like night, um, there's a bunch of them. And I um, will um, agree to put together a list of some of them. I have a friend who has, she offers five to $10,000 for a pitch that is about business through the McGraw Center. And she rarely gets, um, black people applying. It's a big fight we had. I'm like, why don't you ever have any black people? You give that five to $10,000. Said no one pitches me. I was like, oh my God, money on the table. So 
I promise to put together the ones at least that I know about, and um, I'll send it to you, Candace, because this is money we could be getting to so that you're not pre-reporting. You are, you've got, you've done your pitch, you're doing reporting, and often these fellowships will help you find a home for your story if you don't have a natural place to go to. They also provide mentors to kind of help guide you through the process, which is even better. Oh my God, we could go on forever. I'm so glad you guys joined in. Oh, thank you so much for joining us today. And Corey, are you still there? Can you wrap us up? 